everybody, I'm Tall. And I'm Small. And today we're doing Khan Academy's MCAT Prep Biomolecules Fat and Protein Metabolism Questions. First question, what dietary source of energy contains the most energy per gram, which is kilocalories per gram? Disaccharides, cellulose, triglycerides, proteins. <clears throat> so my keto brothers would say that it's, it's fats and that would be triglycerides. I would agree with you. Okay, so I'm going to pick triglycerides and sure enough, it is. But actually, let's look at their hints and see if they explain why. I want to see if I can walk through this one okay. with, without looking at the hints first. Okay, hit me. Um, so I so I know that fats, especially if they are totally saturated with hydrogens, we have the most uh, potential to oxidize those because we can take them more steps. So like the double bond takes away one of the oxidation steps. Mm -hmm. um, but with carbs, even disaccharides or oligosaccharides, they are already... Uh, partially uh, oxidized by those uh, alcohols all over it so mm. that takes away some of the oxida oxidizing that we can do and therefore um, it, we can garner less energy from oxidizing those carbons yeah that that is absolutely it um, okay. I'll read through their stuff um, but you pretty much hit the hit the hammer on the nail the head of the nail <laughs> hit the nail on the head you, you hit it. You just, you hit it. Okay. <laughs> AT, ATP is the biochemical currency of energy is produced by, via the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. Uh, Acetyl-CoA is the starting reactant for the Krebs cycle. In oversimplified terms, in order to produce one molecule of acetyl-CoA, two carbons must be available from a food source. Triglycerides are long chains of hydrocarbons and many molecules of acetyl-CoA can be produced from them. Furthermore, relative to proteins and carbohydrates, they have a low ratio uh, sorry, a low ratio of high molecular weight atoms, oxygen and nitrogen, to hydrocarbons. This makes them energy dense. Triglycerides are the dietary source of energy that can contain the most energy per gram. Very, very cool. Next question. What is the basic order of events in the digestion and mobilization of dietary fats? Is it degradation by lipa lipases leads to emulsified by bile, leads to incorporation into chylomicrons, leads to absorption and conversion into triacylglycerols? You know what? I'm not going to read the rest of these because that's a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> so, or a uh, or a colon full in this case. So, <laughs> we're trying that to. That was bad. We're, <laughs> we're trying to digest and mobilize dietary fats. So, what's the first thing that happens? Uh, of our choices, we can either first de de degrade them with lipases or emulsify them by bile. I think you have to emulsify them. I think uh, yeah. emulsifying them means like uh, like in introducing some other kind of uh, non-polar uh, substance to um, split up all the fats that are trying to uh, bunch together. Yeah, and, and the whole activation... Um for the steps of beta oxidation i think you have to do lipase uh to cut the fat right before you do the rest of it so i think i agree with you i think you need to maybe uh like maybe if you have like a tangled ball ball of yarn mm -hmm. kind of untangle it with some bile yeah and then you know cut up with lipase okay yeah so then we would have emulsified by bile, and then do we degrade, degrade it with lipase, or do we incorporate it into chylomicrons? Okay, chylomicrons, is, I always imagine like uh, uh, some, kind of, um, some kind of polar head with one fatty acid tail. And if we are talking about dietary fats, which are coming in as triacylglycerols, then I think we would have to degrade it first. Yeah, you degrade them, and I do not know the structure for the chylomicrons. I just know they carry mm. triacylglycerol. They carry tags. Oh, um, okay. And so I know that that would be, like, the last step. What So absorption and conversion into tag, and then incorporation into the thing that would carry it around. Okay, because uh, the question, once again, asked uh, digestion and mobilization of dietary fats. So uh, we know we're going to emulsify by bile. Then we want to degrade it by lipases. That gives us our answer immediately. Which, if we pick that one, the next would be uh, absorption and conversion into triacylglycerols, then incorporation into chylomicrons, and we were correct. Okay, so chyla, uh, so we want to emulsify it, which is untangle the ball of yarn. We want to degrade it, chop up the yarn. We then we can absorb it and we can convert it into triacylglycerols, which are our um, that's like the, that's the form that our digestive digestive enzymes want, right? Triacylglycerols. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and then chylomicrons would be like the transportation. Yep, exactly. All right, very cool. Because we all know that yarn is a, an incredibly important dietary supplement, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't know yarn got incorporated into triacyl uh, glycerols. <laughs> so do we want to read the hints? Because we know that we're notoriously bad with fats. Okay, uh, well... I am with remembering beta oxidation. Oh, me so, too. Uh, dietary fats are insoluble in aqueous solution. Okay, thank you, Okem. And cannot <laughs> be absorbed by the intestinal mucosa. That makes okay. sense. Okay. Bile is secreted from the gallbladder to emulsify dietary fat particles to form finely dispersed soluble micelles. So you were right. Mm. You were right along those lines with the one fatty acid tail. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So that happens from bile. That's so cool. I didn't know that. The formation of micelles allows for intestinal lipases to degrade the dietary particles so that they may be absorbed and used to form tags. Okay, so you degrade them, absorb them, then make tags. Yeah. Okay. So lipases enzyme. Huh. Degrade. Why does a lipase, you know, attach to a micelle? I think of micelle, those those liposomes, as like a Mm -hmm. protective barrier kind of i wonder why that's the form the lipases want yeah i'm not sure oh it's just something that breaks down a fat so i guess it takes it in in multiple forms yeah um these tags are incorporated with cholesterol and apolipoproteins within the intestinal mucosa okay. okay and oh yeah so that's that's making that's making the the transportation vessel yep okay all right, next question. Question number three. Based on their compositional differences, different lipoproteins serve very different biological roles. What physical quality of the lipoproteins most likely determines their function? Volume, shape, density, pH. Hmm. Isn't there something about lipoproteins like they only exist on the inside of the cell membrane, on the intracellular? Or sorry, I, cytosolic side? I couldn't tell you because the only thing I remember is uh, glycosylated proteins. So like mm. glycoproteins. Okay, so uh, we're both going to have to MCAT this question. Uh-huh. So compositional differences, meaning um, meaning the actual fatty acid that's on the end. Um, so very different biological roles. What physical quality of lipoproteins most likely determines their function? volume shape density ph oh i'm guessing it's got to be shape right that's what i put i was thinking about anchors yeah into the cell membrane yeah yeah i got it wrong (laughs) oh no it's not shape (laughs) yeah so it's density the correct answer is density let us look at those hints okay lipoproteins are the spherical carrier molecules a se- mm. Oh my god, I'm an idiot. Low density lipoproteins. Oh, ah! they are the carriers that can move through the blood and carry the Oh my gosh. HDL, LDL, VLDL. Wow, I'm embarrassed. Oh, oh, I kept saying like lipoproteins. I was like, okay, so like proteins those? in the cell membrane that have uh lipids on them. <laughs> yep, that's what I was thinking too. Oh gosh. Okay, everybody when you see lipoproteins and and it's, they're talking about fatty acids, Keep remembering HDL, LDL, VLDL, all of that stuff. They're talking about density. The density is the D in there. Um, okay, so yeah, lipoproteins are the spherical carrier, uh, carrier molecules, uh, molecular assemblies. Geez, that's a weird way of wording it. Um, in which lipids are transported throughout the body. Examples include HDL, LDL, and chylomicrons. And then obviously the difference between them is their density. How, how densely are the, are the lipids packed in these lipoproteins? Okay, next question. How do the majority of fatty acids enter the outer membrane of the mitochondria? A transferase facilitated entry of fatty acids, a transferase facilitated entry of carnitine bound fatty acids, free diffusion of hydrophobic free fatty acids, free diffusion of carnitine bound to fatty acids. I'm guessing carnitine is polar. And um, if carnitine is polar, based on just a guess, then it wouldn't move through the membrane nicely. But if you have fatty acids, they should move through the membrane pretty easily. So I would say it's free diffusion. Um, Fatty acids, okay, so how do they enter the, um, the outer membrane of the mitochondria? I am gonna say Although they might not like moving through the inter uh, the intermembrane space, 
That would be my only reservation. But I'm going to go ahead and say free diffusion. I'm wrong. Yeah, so I said transfer is facilitated. And I think I was thinking, like, where we create them, which I think is smoothie are. Yes. Um, and, I, and I can't remember whether or not they have their polar heads. But I know there's all sorts of different flip bases and flop bases and transfer aces. I remember that carnitine had something to do with the mitochondria and carnitine is like a carnival and it helps us bring things inside and outside. Um, mm. And so what they were asking us here, I got this wrong the first time as well, um, but the answer is transferase facilitated entry of carnitine bound fatty acids. And so we know we need some enzyme because the fatty acids that we produce have a polar head um, and like you mentioned, are not going to want to go through uh, any membrane space, any intramembranous space. Mm. Um, and so carnitine is um, a, a molecule that allows us to, you know, bring things from one side <clears throat> to another. Okay. I think I remember it was something with like CoA on it. Yes. So I'm um, looking at their hints and uh, it says three reactions allow for fatty acid entry into the mitochondria. Uh, in a process known as the carnitine shuttle. First, mm -hmm. the the eight, first, oh sorry, acyl CoA synthetase links coenzyme A with the fatty acid um, made favorable by the hydrolysis of two bond A in ATP to make AMP. Two bonds. So Khan Academy <laughs> doesn't always check their spelling. <laughs> And sometimes I say things that sound stupid and it's because they forget to put an S after two bonds. Um, <clears throat> okay, so okay, so first, acyl-CoA synthetase links coenzyme A with a fatty acid um, by the hydrolysis of two bonds in ATP to make AMP. Second, fatty acid uh, acyl-CoA is attached to a carnitine via carnitine acyl transferase one and acyl-carnitine enters the outer membrane. So the majority of fatty acids enter the outer, outer membrane um, of the mitochondria via transferase facilitated entry of carnitine bound fatty acids. Okay, so um, making an energy energetically favorable reaction to help transfer big molecules. Yep. Okay, that's, that's an important thing to remember. All right, next question. Approximately how many molecules of ATP can be produced from the oxidation of a 20 carbon fatty acid, including those produced in the Krebs cycle, 107, 129, 136, or 100. Okay, so we have a 20 carbon fatty acid. We want to know how many molecules of ATP can be produced um, from the oxi from the oxidation. Uh, I think Small just uh, had a brain blast, hit an answer, and then didn't get it right. <laughs> yeah, yep, that was painful. Okay, it sucks when those brain blasts don't pay out. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, <clears throat> we have 20 carbons. Um, they want to know how many ATPs and they're, ta they're including all of those produced in the Krebs cycle. If we have 20 carbons, then, um, I, I we're skipping glycolysis completely. Mm -hmm. We're going straight into the citric acid cycle. Yep. So if we're in the citric acid cycle, what's the input to the citric acid cycle? It's uh, acetyl CoA, right? Yep. So if we have an acetyl CoA, that's two carbons. Mm -hmm. So 20 divided by 2 would be 10. So you can make 10 coas, uh, sorry, acetyl coas from um, this 20 carbon fatty acid. <clears throat> so from the uh, citric acid cycle, I remember from a previous video we just did that you, uh, in, in the citric acid cycle, which is the Krebs cycle, you make um, you make one ATP, you make three. NADHs and you make one FADH2. So that's one ATP already. And if we have um, 10 acetyl CoAs, then that's 30 FA, uh, sorry, 30 NADHs and um, that is 10 FADH2s. So for every NADH, you can make three ATPs. So that's 90 ATPs from the NADHs. From every FADH, you can make two ATPs. So that would be 20 ATPs coming from FADH. So that's 110. And you should add one more. And that's not an answer. 111 is not an answer on this. So I messed something up in there with math. But granted, I was doing all that in my head on the fly. 
So I am going to just start picking randomly while I keep talking to you guys <laughs> and eventually get the correct answer of 136. Let's look at that map. The brain blast that I had was, oh, we have 10 ATP equivalents per uh, per round of the Krebs cycle. And if we had a 20 carbon molecule, and I know that beta oxidation breaks off the fat two by two carbons, you know, at two carbons at a time, basically, then I could feed my my Krebs cycle and uh if I if I had 10 sets of acetyl CoA which is not actually the product because um, I could only actually do nine rounds of Krebs then I was like oh well maybe I would get a hundred uh, uh and I ran right into that one <laughs> <laughs> okay so <clears throat> their hints are actually pretty helpful so uh, it says start simple a 20 carbon fatty acid will yield 10 molecules of acetyl CoA we got there uh recall that for each acetyl CoA the Krebs cycle produces 10 molecules of ATP. This would save you a lot of time that I went through all the details of. For every acetyl-CoA, you're producing 10 molecules of ATP. Right, which which is why I went with uh, 100. Okay, And yes. I, then I was missing some pieces. Uh, so then after that, it says, remember that the process of oxidizing fatty acids to form molecules of acetyl-CoA also generates energy each pass of beta oxidation generates one molecule of NADH and one molecule of FADH2. To produce 10 acetyl CoA, this fatty acid will require nine passes of oxidation. Dang, there it is. Okay, so um, with the two and a half ATP that can be generated per NADH and one and a half ATP generated per FADH2, um, so we already know, so if we have 10 acetyl CoA, we know for every acetyl CoA you're getting 10 molecules of ATP, there's 100. Mm -hmm. But we had to remember that in beta oxidation, we're also generating one NADH and one FADH. Did not remember that. Right. So if we remember that 2.5 ATP per NADH and 1.5 ATP per FADH2, we see 2.5 times 9 is 22.5. 1.5 times 9 is 13.5. Those two added together is 36 plus our initial 100, 136. Nice. Okay. That makes sense. So, um, like, really remember the numbers. Remember the amounts that are coming out of all of these metabolism things, all the ATP produced and all the NADH and FADH2 produced, and you can basically just uh, wiggle your way through any of the metabolism problems and write it down. Okay, next question. What are the major products of amino acid catabolism? Ketone bodies and tetrahydrofolate, glucose and tetrahydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate and glycogen, or ketone bodies and glucose. Amino acid catabolism. So you're building something from amino acids. Uh, I know this is not like a very uh, useful uh, metabolism or it's not, it's just not used a lot. Um, <clears throat> I would say that, well, we wanna make glucose, right? Yes. So we wanna make glucose. So I'm going to immediately rule everything that doesn't have glucose in it. So that leaves me with either glucose and tetrahydrofolate or ketone bodies and glucose. Um, I literally could not say between the two, but tetrahydrofolate, oh, I do not remember what that does. I think it's some kind of signaling molecule. So I would have to say ketone bodies and glucose. Hey, I was right. So uh, this was one of the last couple PowerPoints that we covered in my biochem class, which I keep talking about because it was incredible. Um, but you can have, when you do amino acid catalysis, you can have those that are um, ketogenic, or you can have those that are glucogenic, or you can have those that are both. So specific amino acids are more ketogenic or glucogenic? Yeah, so you have uh, a variety of them that can make uh, both, and then you have some, like I think there's like five that can make... Um, Oh, I forget the numbers. I don't know the yeah, numbers yeah. anymore. Yeah, but like some of them can, some of them are really favorable towards glucose. Some of them are really favorable towards uh, ketones. Yep. Okay, interesting. I really would not have guessed that, but I guess it's the R groups that make the difference. Yep. Okay. And it, uh, I think a good deal of it was size, you know, car amount of carbons on it. And, and what do oh. I have the potential to make from that? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. You know that lysine, that arginine are making ketones. <laughs> I have no idea. Actually, don't quote me on that, but quote me on that, people. Okay. So the correct answer was ketone bodies and glucose. Let me read through their hints real quick. There are two main pathways by which amino acids are metabolized. The two groups are defined by the end products of the amino acids degraded. 
one group is degraded to uh, acetoacetyl-CoA mm -hmm. and or acetyl-CoA. The other is degraded to pyruvate, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, fumarate, and or oxaloacetate. Do you remember the, the substrates in that second sentence? So uh, pyruvate, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, fumarate, uh, oxaloacetate, did those ring a bell? Um, oxaloacetate and pyruvate did. Okay. Because I think you use those in gluconeogenesis. Those are all of the, or most of the reactants in the Krebs cycle. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so those, I think, would be my gluco, so my glucogenic ones. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Ah, and then acetoacetyl-CoA and or acetyl-CoA. Definitely ketogenic. Ketogenic. Okay, and it says the amino acids contributing to each of these pathways are called ketogenic or glucogenic, respectively. All right. Interesting. So I guess that's no... Yeah, that you probably could have reasoned that without knowing uh, about those, but um, at least be familiar with, like, the look. Like she said, just to to um, to recognize that that's, that's your citric acid cycle. Those are your reactants. Okay. Next question. From where are the nine essential amino acids utilized by humans derived? Uh, is it both exogenous and endogenous sources, de novo synthesis only, dietary protein only, or none of the above? So when they say essential amino acids, I think that means, the, the origin of that word means it's essential to be in your diet. Exactly. So I think it's dietary protein only, and I would be correct. All right, very cool. Next question. A deficiency of oxaloacetate would most likely increase the catabolism of what potential energy source? Acetyl-CoA, ketogenic uh, amino acids, glucogenic amino acids, or aceto acetoacetyl aceto acetyl coa acetoacetyl coa how do you say that word oh lord acetoacetyl coa <laughs> we're just gonna roll with that one yep <clears throat> okay so we have a deficiency in oxaloacetate um so that's going to increase the catabolism so the creation of which potential energy source if you don't have uh oxaloacetate so oxaloacetate combines with acetyl coa in gluconeogenesis uh, in the Krebs cycle. Oh, in the Krebs cycle. Okay, yes, yes, yes. So I'm assuming if you have a deficiency in oxaloacetate, you wouldn't increase the catabolism of acetyl-CoA um, because that you don't have enough oxaloacetate to make that pathway happen. Nice. Um, I'm guessing the same is for the one I can't pronounce. <laughs> yeah. Acetoacetyl-CoA. Um, okay, so then glucogenic amino acids or ketogenic amino acids. Uh, we keep talking about like Krebs cycle, which is part of like glycolysis and Krebs cycle and then oxidative phosphorylation. So I'm going to say that we would increase the catabolism of ketogenic amino acids. Ketogenic? Yeah. Why ketogenic? Because I'm dumb and I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, you could actually tell that three of these answer choices are really along the same lines. We talked about ketogenic amino acids being those... Um, oh God, that was so stupid. Yeah, oh, you're so right. <laughs> that include things uh, that don't include, but um, make things like acetyl-CoA um, and acetoacetyl-CoA, however you say it. Oh, that was good. Um, I tried. Thank you. <laughs> but I know that oxaloacetate is something that is derived from a carb. I know it's one of those carby molecules that we can't get any other way. I also know that you mentioned it before, uh, but I want to make sure you know it and you don't just watch my face for reaction. Okay. Um, but in the first step of gluconeogenesis, it's it's part of that step 10 that's so hard to overcome. And so we have those two enzymes that help us do it in gluconeogenesis. And so we start from pyruvate and then we have to add a carbon to oxaloacetate before we can get back to that phosphoenol pyruvate that's so such a high unstable energy level. That's uh, PEP, right? Pep? Yep. We okay. have to step up there. So we have to take two steps because it's such a high jump. Um, uh. And it's easy to go the other way through glycosis anyway. 
Mm-hmm. So um, this is that's one of those long tracks that I had to mention to how I get to my answer. But I know that you can make fats from from carb derivatives. So I can take pyruvate, which is a carb derivative, and get to acetyl-CoA, which is a fatty thing, mm-hmm. because I can also make that from beta oxidation of a fatty acid. Right. But I can never, never, never go the opposite way. I can never take acetyl-CoA and go back to pyruvate or anything like that or make oxaloacetate from acetyl-CoA. So I need to know that oxaloacetate is one of my carby things. So that would, I think that's even the logic that I was going with. And when you said ketogenic, I now understand why you were confused at me saying ketogenic. And I just said, yeah. And I clicked it and I was wrong. Yeah. You, I mean, you <laughs> walked me through and you even said gluconeogenesis, which made me think like, oh yeah, he remembers that it's in that pathway. So he knows it's a carby thing. Mm. Um, but if your biochem professor didn't stress that enough, sometimes it's hard to remember, oh yeah, there's like a, I can go this way, but I can't go that way relationship with these kind of things. Okay. And it's so cool that amino acids can also be thrown into this. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Okay. This is very cool. I like this. All right. Question number nine. What chemical properties describe a free fatty acid molecule capable of producing the most energy when used as a fuel source relative to other fatty acids, free fatty acids? Is it? Okay. So we're looking for chemical properties producing the most energy so is it longer hydrocarbon tail with a greater number of unsaturated bonds shorter hydrocarbon tail with a lesser number of unsaturated bonds shorter hydrocarbon tail with a greater number of unsaturated bonds or longer hydrocarbon tail with a lesser number of unsaturated bonds we want saturation yep and we want a long hydrocarbon tail. Yeah. So the answer should be, by that logic, longer hydrocarbon tail with a greater number of satu- unsaturated bonds. A greater number of unsaturation? No. Mm-hmm. We want a lesser number of unsaturation. And I know if you were taking the test that you would not have made that mistake. It's sometimes I'm glad just you have the faith in me. <laughs> I know it's just talking out, sound, out, out, sound, out loud. Sometimes we say things that... It, it would have been like a no-brainer to actually just write down the right answer, but like saying yes. them is, mixes us up. Okay, so a longer hydrocarbon table, uh, tail and lesser number of unsaturated bonds. Every unsaturated bond means it's not saturated with hydrogens and it has a double bond there. We, we do not want those. We want it Why? full of hydrogens. I don't know. So one degree of... So, so this is a really good big metabolism idea to to hammer down make sure we really know is anytime we have a carbon if we're fully saturated a bunch of hydrogens around it just like you said the reason that's important is because i can take that and i have three or four steps of oxidation that i can do to that carbon to get energy from it right so beta oxidation would be the oxidation of fatty acids i also oxidize glucose to get all the energy i can from it and all of those steps that it goes through so if oxidation garners energy from carbon sources like fats and carbs then i want the most uh, oxidizable state of this thing so the most that reduced. i can yeah 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 oh so the, yeah reduce m- more reduction in a hydrocarbon tail yep. means more hydrogens so you do not want unsaturation because a double bond is a step of oxidation right and i yeah would, i can't get that back right right i'm one down already okay very cool Next question, final question, question number 10. What is the rate limiting step in the production of energy from free fatty acids? Carnitine acyl transferase activity, dehydrogenation of fatty acyl-CoA, beta oxidation within the mitochondrial matrix, or degradation of acetyl-CoA to enter the Krebs cycle. Okay, rate limiting step in the production of energy from free fatty acids. So this has to be coming from free fatty acids, which means you do beta oxidation Mm -hmm. on the fatty acid, which the rate limiting step there, I have no idea what it would be. Um, So you go from the hydrocarbon chain, which is the fatty acid, you create acetyl-CoA, and then acetyl-CoA is used in the Krebs cycle that's how that that's the pathway basically for beta oxy from for fatty acids is doing that no not correct i have no idea oh okay this is my achilles heel of metabolism that's embarrassing okay so if we're doing that 
then um, carnitine acyl transferase activity. Well, we did learn before that carnitine acyl transferase might be involved in moving fatty acids. Yeah, but because it's a transferase, I would think that it, I don't think it would be the right limiting step. Okay, good, good, good point. Okay, so dehydrogenation of fatty acyl CoA. So fatty acyl CoA means a fatty acid tail uh, with an a with a acetyl co or sorry acyl CoA attached to it. And a dehydrogenase is something that oxidizes something else. So I would almost venture to say that the oxidation step would be would take some energy and therefore be uh, something that would take some yeah uh, the some time rate limiting maybe. Wait, doesn't oxidation release Oops. energy? I got it wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think oxidation releases energy, but uh, because I've learned from your mistake now, I'm going to continue on. So uh, beta oxidation within the mitochondrial matrix. That one feels like it might be right. Uh, the, last qu the last possible answer is degradation of acetyl-CoA to enter the Krebs cycle. Degradation. Isn't that what beta oxidation is? It's the, oh no, degradation of acetyl-CoA. You don't deg, you don't degrade acetyl CoA in order to enter the Krebs cycle. Acetyl CoA enters the Krebs cycle. I'm gonna say it's beta oxidation within the mitochondrial matrix, and I'm wrong. <laughs> but it was carnitine, wasn't it? Carnitine. It was totally carnitine. Acyl transferase activity, folks. Okay, let's look at those hints. The utilization of fatty acids is a coordinated balance of synthesis and oxidation, which is tightly regulated. Okay, utilizing fatty acids, you are balancing synthesis and oxidation. Um, when carbohydrate sources of energy are, re are readily available, meaning glucose, the metabolism of acetyl-CoA yields melonyl-CoA uh, in great abundance. Melonyl-CoA induces the synthesis of fatty acids. Um, in addition to its contribution to fatty acid synthesis, melonyl-CoA also inhibits fatty acid oxidation at a key regulatory point. Melonyl-CoA inhibits carnitine acyl transferase 1 on the outer mitochondrial membrane. The carnitine-mediated entry of fatty acids into the mitochondria, the carnitine shuttle, is the limiting step in beta oxidation. Okay, so you when you have carbohydrates available you are going to yield melanol-CoA to a yeah. certain extent. So I don't know the step to get there because just as I'm bad at beta oxidation of fatty acids, I also am not familiar with the synthesis. That was near the end and it did not go well. Um, but I know that acetyl-CoA two carbons turns into melanol-CoA in, in the first step of synthesis, I think. And it is a three carbon molecule. So I start building up from there. Mm. Okay, so um, it, 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 it synthesizes fatty acids. It doesn't break them down, which would be the um, which would be the metabolism. Yeah, it says it actually inhibits fatty acid oxidation. It inhibits breaking down. It inhibits it by stopping carnitine acyl transferase on the outer mitochondrial membrane. Mm. Okay, so you need that car that carnitine shuttle to get um, to get mitochondria in. That is going to be the rate limiting step for beta oxidation. All right. So think about, so my friends and I, when we were, you know, harried towards the end of uh, biochem, and this was like the last thing that was thrown in, uh, we remembered the carnitine shuttle by being like a, a carnival ride. What, the the one that turns, what is that called? Carousel. A carousel, yeah, just like that. It kind of works like that. So if we think of it as like a very slow carousel, that's regulated. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I know that I'm always really bad with lipids. Mm -hmm. I like, I barely even remember doing them in biochem. And you're a keto guy. Yeah, I know. But um, lipids are gonna bite me in the butt. Yeah. Strong work. Kinda. 